Hey guys, welcome to the show. Today on the show I've got uh, someone by the name of Brian Kelly. He's here today to talk about his uh, podcast and his story. Uh, he actually runs a very niche specific podcast called What the Speak. It's all about public speaking, so we're actually going to talk a little bit about that today. Uh, welcome to the show, Brian. Hey John, thanks so much for having me on the show. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. So do you want to share your story, like you know how you got started in you know online marketing and entrepreneurship? Absolutely. Well, John, first, before we get started, I wanted to mention a couple of things. Um, apologize in advance to your audience. Two things. I tend to be a bit of a long-winded individual. I'm from Chicago, uh, and they call us the Windy City for multiple reasons, that being one of them. Um, and also, we have a tendency to brag a little bit. So um, as I talk about my story, uh, hopefully it doesn't sound a little bit uh, too boisterous. But that's just how we are in Chicago. <laughs> that's all good. <laughs> all right, so John, I've got two stories that I would probably say overlap, and we can talk a little bit about both of those stories. And the first is my entrepreneurial journey, and ultimately the thing that's kind of led me up to today, where I'm I'm doing the show with WhatTheSpeak.com, and kind of my grand vision for what I see there. So of course, like many of us, it started way back when. I was a little kid. My dad was one of those individuals that always had ideas. Um, and I can remember my, at the earliest age, in uh, probably the very early 1980s when I was just a little kid, going with my dad to downtown Chicago when the Pope at that time was visiting Chicago. And he started making these t-shirts that he was peddling out on the street for all of the people who had come to see the Pope. And that impression, that uh, creative entrepreneurial endeavor I think you know that was when the seed was planted in me and ever since then I've kind of taken that ball and run um, some other things that my dad did when I was growing up as a kid uh, in the 80s you know video games were just kind of becoming really big and he would always sketch out different designs for certain um, like joysticks and controllers for uh, things like Atari and uh, right. a lot of the computer games Commodore 64 etc um, and then also, way back uh, in the day, I remember him designing, uh, he had all these you know, schematic drawings and everything for an e-reader, of all things. So kind of what we know today as the Kindle, this idea that he had was a combination of the Kindle along with something like the early Game Boy, if you remember that, with the cartridges that you'd slide oh, yeah. in. Yep. And he'd kind of envisioned you know, this type of screen that you could have, um, you know, that, that easy electronic ink to you know, read it and have that be soft on your eyes. And then each book it essentially would be these cartridges that you would swap in and out. So it was pretty funny to see some of those things. Um, and he obviously you know, was just a dreamer. That particular thing didn't go anywhere. But um, as I got older into like junior high and high school, he ended up starting a couple different businesses that did well. And um, I, was, I was hooked. So um, what happened was I went to college, I actually studied uh, music business at a school called Belmont University in Nashville, Tennessee. It's got the top music business program in the world, um, and that's probably sounding a little bit uh, braggadocious there, but it really is one of the top schools. Uh, I went to school with folks like uh, Brad Paisley, who's a huge country music star, um, and, and a bunch of other folks, people who are executives in the music business, etc. So of course, Trying to get in the music business, that's very entrepreneurial. Um, you know, I studied not only musical performance, but also the business side of things, uh, in addition, uh, like audio production, uh, music production, etc. Um, now, when I was in college, my girlfriend at the time, who actually now is, is my wife, um, we, were, we were dating, and we both were very creative individuals, and she was a photographer and graphic designer. And so, of course, we had this pool of people that we were, you know, very social with, friends, um, et cetera, and a lot of them were trying to break it into the music business. And what do you need when you're trying to break it in the music business? Well, you need a headshot, you need uh, artwork for your, your album or your CD, you know, back then it was CDs, yeah. um, and then also like your website, that was starting to, to become a big thing for promotion was having your own website. And so we had this idea, hey, let's start a company where we can you know, provide this service to all of these folks that we know and, and kind of help them on that particular front. So you know, it was a, a design company, so to speak, where 
you know, we, we provided this service, but it was really just kind of a side business thing. We were still very much focused on, um, you know, what we were doing in school. But what happened was it eventually led to us starting a business, a real design business, um, after we graduated college. And at that time, we, we had another partner join the company and grew it over the years to a seven-figure business. Um, and that's probably a whole other story. Yeah. But the thing was we were able to take that creative approach, that entrepreneurial approach, and build something around that. Now, part of where the story gets really interesting is right around 2006, we were still a fairly new company. And we started getting into product design. So prior to that, we were doing a lot of graphic and visual communication work for large corporations. Um, we had uh, clients like Warner Brothers Studios in Los Angeles. Um, we were doing product packaging, all sorts of fun stuff. So we started getting into physical design. And one of my partners, who is a very talented artist, starting, started dreaming up these ideas for home decor items. Um, and I don't know if you know Frank Lloyd Wright, um, who was a big, probably America's most famous architect um, and had a major presence here in Chicago. Uh, we decided to create products using his designs and we got a license with the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation to do that. Um, so that got us into a whole new area of design that we really you know, had no prior experience with. Wow. The really interesting thing is we started using a lot of the online technology available to us to promote that business. Nobody knew who we were in that particular industry or market. So in 2006, we started a blog that was all about this topic of what our, our target audience was interested in. It was Frank Lloyd Wright architecture and design. And there's a whole um, really surprising vast niche within that, that realm or that that area of interest with Frank Lloyd Wright's architecture that we were able to start driving traffic to the site because of all the interesting content we were producing and in a matter of months um, you know went from nobody knew who we were to like Dwell Magazine which is a big magazine for architect fans um, they invited us out to one of their conferences to cover it with live blogging and uh, we started a podcast so we were like podcasting live from that uh, conference that they had interviewing some really famous architects yeah. and grew that to about 40,000 subscribers and that was a major part of our business being able to build that online platform and ultimately sell the products that we produced um, so it was you know before we, we got into the realm of like producing digital or information based products it was purely physical products that we sold through our online store and also it raised the visibility so we got a lot of publicity out of that um, made a lot of uh, really good friendships and relationships with magazine editors other influential bloggers in that space um, and it, it was it was really a fascinating time and also like I had mentioned we started doing podcasting so we we did podcasting back when nobody knew who pod, or what podcasting was right, right. and uh, we did it for probably about three or four years and um, eventually st stopped it, which it's now, you know, it seems like podcasting is kind of where blogging was at back in those uh, early days in, in the mid-2000s. So we might be revisiting that with that particular site. But the, the podcast interviews that I did as a part of that was ultimately what led me to, you know, it was kind of the early shape or form of what now I'm doing at whatthespeak.com, yeah. where I'm interviewing different, you know, folks who are experts on certain topics and exploring that through that conversation. So it was kind of like the, the practice or the training ground for me to go that direction. Now, um, let's talk about speaking. So this is kind of where the stories overlap. Now again, back in the early days as a kid, I was the kid who in class, I would love when the teacher would call on me to read in front of the class. <laughs> Now most of us, when we're in class, we look away, we don't try and engage the teacher, we kind of put our heads down, but I was always the kid that was raising my hand saying, oh, you know, I'll read, I'll read, I'll read. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know why, it was just kind of, I guess, the, the way that um, I was, but I always got a thrill out of being able to get up and kind of show off, you know, I could read this book, I could read this passage without stumbling, um, and I don't know, I was a geek like that. 
Yeah. yeah. Um, and then as I got older, um, I always loved giving presentations. You know, when we'd have class projects where we'd have to get up and give a report of some kind. Um, I always just got a thrill out of that. And then when I got to high school, um, I was actually pretty active in, in our local church. And on Sunday evenings, once a month, they used to let um, the kids in the youth or certain kids in the youth group get up and, and deliver a message that Sunday. And that was another thing that I really, you know, got a kick out of being, ha being able to have that opportunity to share, you know, my ideas, my reflections, my thoughts with individuals, and, and kind of make that connection um, through that that process of delivering, you know, a speech or a presentation. So, of course, when I got to college and I was studying music, we're on stage. That's what you do when you're a performer. And um, when I remember my freshman year. It was a very competitive uh, school to get into. And on the first day of class, uh, or rather the first week of class, we started this weekly. Every Wednesday you had to go into the auditorium and perform in front of all of your peers, um, and they would essentially critique you. And that was one of those experiences that would, was very, very intense, very difficult. You know, if you think for a lot of us, public speaking alone is very terrifying. But to get up on stage and not only have to stand with everybody's eyes on you, but, you know, that place of vulnerability where you're singing in front of a group of people um, and they're just staring there and you know they're all going to be critiquing you was right. pretty scary. So it w that was a great... Uh, opportunity for me to be able to learn you know, how to speak clearly in front of an audience and combining that with obviously mu musical performance but really you know working on a stage commanding certain um, you know sections of the room connecting with the audience um, those were all you know the, the early stages of me kind of figuring out all of this so while it was it was singing it was musical performance uh, there still was that element that tied directly into public speaking. So, of course, fast forward to when we started our business. When we started the business, we had no money. So we had to go out and obviously drum up business. We also had to pitch our ideas and our concepts to partners, potential clients, vendors, and convince all of these people that you know we, we weren't just some kids that had you know interesting ideas that we actually had the business acumen to be able to perform and deliver on all of these ideas that we were pitching right so that was another great training ground for me to understand the best ways to communicate what it is that you want to do whether it's your passion your message whatever it is that you're trying to convey to somebody else or a group of other people to convince them to do something or to make a decision on the information that you're presenting to them, um, it was a really great opportunity. Um, of course, you know, through the, the time with that business, um, I was able to do a lot of lectures, so people started inviting us to come and speak on our areas of expertise um, at different universities and whatnot, and that was also a really big opportunity for me to kind of continue to advance my skills with public speaking. Um, and then just a couple years ago, I had a really uh, amazing opportunity to take a position as a marketing executive at a company. And that was kind of the culmination of everything that I had done because um, through that, that role, one of the major things was speaking at industry conferences and delivering um, you know, valuable content that helped people in that industry that ultimately, you know, hopefully they would become customers. But... It was more about sharing uh, thought leadership and information of value to help these folks with you know, the particular problem or problems that they were facing. Uh, also, as part of that, we have our annual conference and uh, being involved in that with the MC role and also speaking at that conference uh, was, again, a huge opportunity for me. So all of these things coming together led me to this past year thinking about you know, how, how can I really take advantage of the things, the experiences, the knowledge that I've gained and be able to give back to people um, all of that information? And so I started thinking about being able to create a show where I talk about different you know, tips, tricks, uh, great expert discussions and offering that up to folks to be able to really help them elevate their game. 
and kind of the tagline is to kick ass when you speak, present, or pitch. And that's yeah. really what I want to do is I want to be able to take people who might be a little timid um, in this area and help them feel more comfortable. And for those who are like, yeah, I got this, you know, I can get up in front of an audience and speak to help them go to the next level to where they're not just comfortable speaking in front of an audience, but they're making a tremendous impact when they speak. Yeah. So, so that's um, pretty much where you've really decided to, to you know, make your main focus now is this podcast. And I know, what, what was your most recent? You've got 19 episodes now, it looks like. Yeah, we've got 19 episodes. Um, just last week was our 19th one with Pat Flynn. Um, and we are getting ready also to launch to iTunes. So we're starting off with that launch with five episodes uh, so the, the first five, and then we're going to be releasing three a week, and that's going forward. So right now we're on a, a once-a-week schedule every Wednesday. We've been posting those to whatthespeak.com, um, and as soon as we get in iTunes and kind of catch up, uh, we'll probably be doing, or we'll definitely be doing three a week on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday type schedule. And we've got some great guests. You know, I've, I've had some amazing people on the show so far, like uh, Michael Hyatt, Chris Brogan, um, Derek Halpern's been on the show. Yep. Uh, like I just mentioned, Pat Flynn. Also, some really cool people that have um, information related to like performance skills. Um, I, I recently interviewed a gentleman who is like a performance coach, essentially, mm -hmm. for people like Taylor Swift. Um, oh, wow. So he works with them on how to get on stage and how to you know interact with the audience from a stage, which is very important to people who are are public speaking. Um, Jay Bear has been a guest, so some just awesome people. And now, um, as we continue to march forward, we've got like Dan Pink is scheduled. Um, uh, geez, we've got a long list. Sally Hogshead's on on that list. So really large, big name keynote speakers, as well as other experts um, in like psychology and uh, other areas of of interest that all tie into public speaking and, and being able to get up in front of an audience and deliver. Yeah, I think that's really cool. I mean, where are you where, where are you looking to kind of take the show in the future? I mean, I could easily see this being sort of monetized as like a membership course or even just, you know, some sort of like one-time course where you could maybe like train people and just combine all of these results and everything that you've learned into like a massive, you know, learning place for people to go. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you, you hit the nail on the head because the, the, the plan is to be able to offer a community for people to come and essentially develop these skills. So, um, you know, we put out a survey not too long ago to our, our readers to try and get a little bit of insight. We actually started getting a lot of questions about, you know, how do I put together my slides? You know, that's something that I really struggle with is being able to create slides that are very visual. And a lot of people these days with, with, Folks like Nancy Duarte um, writing on this topic as well as Gar Reynolds about presentation design. A lot of people have been elevating their game and SlideShare is a huge thing where you've got very visual, um, you know, engaging slides. And so people are like, how do I go from bullet point and like black and white text to something that looks interesting and, and do it in a way to where I can do it. I'm not a designer, but I want to be able to make my slides. I can't afford to pay somebody else. So we've got a ton of questions on that, um, and that's one area you know we might be looking at in the near future to developing. Maybe it's a membership site, maybe it's an online training or course on how to do that specifically, um, how to do slides that are very easy to design if you're a non-designer, but have a lot of visual impact and interest. Um, so those are those are some of the ways. I think you know, like you said, membership site, online courses, um, you know, probably coaching is something that. I would um, you know look at doing as as we get kind of inquiries related to that and some other things. But the the podcast is really just to provide people with some great content to help them start thinking about this particular area. Yeah, if they need help with it, or you know, I mean, I even remember now that you talk about it, just the whole idea of the classroom, and um, you know, I remember going through a particular course that was on. I can't remember the exact topic, but they, you know, I think it was very much like a verbal course where it was all about this topic. Like you had to get up and, you know, regarding 
speaking in public or speaking in front of audiences and they basically gave you assignments and I was like deathly afraid of this at the time, <laughs> I remember and being so nervous and it just all kind of comes with practice. Um, I mean, I guess really, you know, you've obviously you now interviewed almost 20 people, if not more. I don't know if you've got others you just haven't published, but yeah. Um, I mean, what are some of the things that like you've really taken away from from interviewing some of these big name people like Pat Flynn and Derek and you know, I know a lot of these guys are all you know public speakers. I know even Pat recently had something where I think he did like a huge keynote speech and he he talked about spending so much time preparing for this kind of stuff. Yeah. So, I mean, what are some like big takeaways that you really learned just listening to, to these folks? Well, it's interesting to kind of get their perspective um, for a couple reasons. You know, some of the the folks that I've interviewed, um, they've they've been speaking for 25 years. Um, there's other people like Pat Flynn or even Derek Halpern who two years ago, um, you know, they first started speaking because they had developed this area of expertise and they, you know, were going to industry conferences. People wanted them to share their ideas and they really didn't know what they were doing when it came to, to delivering an effective um, public speech. And I don't know if, if, you, if you saw the Derek Halpern interview, but we talk about this like his first presentation he ever gave, and it's actually up on YouTube. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, you can go check it out. Um, and it's pretty funny. He's talked about it before, and he's just like, oh, man, it's the worst. It was just terrible, terrible, terrible. And the funny thing is, if you were to go back and look at it, like his content was solid. Like the information that he was delivering was stuff that anybody would be, you know, sitting there with a notepad just jotting every little thing down. But his delivery was you know, flat, kind of boring, you know, just not not something that was really engaging or something that would hold that audience's attention the whole time. Right. Um, but luckily he did have his content. So, you know, he said, after that, that was when I decided I'm going to get as good as I can with speaking in the shortest amount of time. You know, I want to go in and, and just be able to fully engage my audience because I have important things to say. I have important things to share. And I want people to walk away from that and take action. So, you know, in that discussion, we talk specifically about what he did. And Pat's, it's kind of the, the same thing. You know, he was invited to speak a couple years ago at a conference. But, but he was, he's the kind of person that right away, he is all about pouring 100% of what he's got into that. And so prior to him going to that first opportunity to speak, um, you know, he was able to focus a lot of energy on thinking through what it was that he was going to deliver, how he was going to deliver it, and he just, he's that kind of a guy that pays, a, you know, a lot of attention to those finer details. Right, right. And so, you know, same thing, he said he, he went, it was really good, people, you know, had great things to say about it, but he just personally felt like, okay, there's still a whole lot more room for improvement. And um, so he goes into to how he was able to do that. And now today, in just a couple of short years, you know, he's, he's gone from being invited to speak at a conference for essentially free to where now he's getting paid really good money as a keynote speaker. And he's already done a couple this year. And he, he plans to do more. And he does, I mean, he's like a rock star. Like he thinks through how this is almost like a performance or this is a show that he's putting on. Yeah. And he's got, I forget what episode number it is, it's, it's a few weeks ago from right now, today, um, in, in the first couple of weeks of December that we're recording this discussion. But if you go back, it's probably early November, one of his episodes is all about public speaking and what he does, how he does it, and he kind of walks through like, when I gave this keynote, this is how I staged this whole thing, and this is how I created a moment of interest right out of the gate. Um, so it's it's interesting to see what he's done there, and I'm I'm excited to kind of continue to follow him um, as he progresses more and more with his his skills as a public speaker. Um, another insight that was really cool. Um, this interview hasn't gone live yet. In fact, I haven't even recorded it yet. Uh, Sally Hogshead, who's a New York Times best-selling author um, of a book called Fascinate, she's got a new book coming out this spring. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to record an interview leading up to, to her release of that book. But she is one of those people that a number of years ago she got into speaking. Um, she wrote a book and then you know was asked, like most authors, to go out and speak about their book. 
and she was making uh, you know a modest income with speaking, um, nothing that was really a big splash. And when she wrote her second book, she realized how important it was to really be as phenomenal of a speaker as she could be. And so she put everything into her education, her training, coaching, etc., and planning out what these presentations were going to look like. So when her second book came out, she made a huge splash, and she went from charging you know a couple thousand or a few thousand dollars per speaking gig to ultimately I, I think she's charging you know it's in the tens of thousands of dollars. It's not cheap. She's a, a big name speaker today, and it was the effort and focus that she put into that that allowed her to to kind of achieve that level. Yeah. And so we're going to talk through that story um, in that discussion with her and exactly what she did and how she did it. But essentially, you know, the insight that I got from an earlier previous discussion I had with her um, in person, you know, she was all about the show. And when you see her, you know, I, I think there's videos of her on YouTube. Like I know she's got a TED Talk. Um, if you go and look at that, you can see she's a, sh a showman. She puts on you know, almost kind of like a, a rock concert type approach to what she does. When hmm. she gets out on stage, you know, the TED Talk's not like this one, but when she gives a keynote, they they get they do the introduction, you know, the MC introduces her, and then yeah. the lights go down, and the music comes up, and she's got this whole, like, video introduction, and it just kind of raises the energy, and then she gets out there, and she just takes command of the stage. You know, yeah. she fills that entire space. And she, you know, she's very passionate about what it is that she's speaking about. She gets down off the stage and gets into the audience. You know, a lot of different things that make her stand out. And last year, the National Speakers Association, which is kind of the professional organization for those that are professional speakers, awarded her with the highest honor. Um, she was um, inducted into their Hall of Fame as a speaker, which is you know a phenomenal, phenomenal award and his testament to what she did by really just following this dedication and this path to learning how to be as in, engaging of a speaker as possible. And it's had a direct impact on her business. Um, you know, being an entrepreneur, I oftentimes, it's one of the, the key questions I like to ask my guests is, so public speaking is great, and being able to share your ideas is great, but what's the impact been on your business? And everybody, you know, has a unique take on it, but ultimately, it's something that if you can learn how to speak clearly and in a way that's, that's engaging and fascinating about your business, it's only going to have you know, a tremendous impact on what you do and, and ultimately what you're trying to do or the audience you're trying to reach. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it is really cool that um, you know, there's so much to be improved upon. And I know even um, you know, there, was a, there was a particular speaker that I know, um, you know, and this is obviously anyone could really do this, and I'm sure there's lots of people out there that just kind of have this knack. But when it comes to really like making sales and you know, having like the power of words to be able to convince people to be like so in tune with what you're saying and so all about it, um, you know, I know I think it was probably four years ago I went to an event that um, – it was all focused around the popular fitness program, Beachbody. Oh, yeah. And um, I used to be really big into, like, P90X and stuff, you know, years ago. And uh, they had this event where Tony Horton, the you know, he's, like, the creator of P90X. He came out to Boston, where we are here in Massachusetts. And I did this whole fitness event where you work out with 300 people. Wow. And I remember doing yoga and being, like, really relaxed. And then we went into an auditorium all packed in. And Tony did this sort of, like, presentation on, you know, changing lives all over the world and then at the same time it was like a comedy show because he was he's sort of a comedian so it was yeah. like this crazy like you know just the way that he was able to influence the room you know I was I remember leaving that day and um, being so like excited and pumped up I was I went to a party at my buddies and I was doing push-ups in the kitchen you know showing off to some girls like t telling them I want to be their coach and help them out and stuff because I was yeah. so intrigued by the speech and just so amped up about it you know well, it's funny that you say that because Tony Horton, you know, very much like yourself, I, I've I've done P90X and, and a lot of the other programs that he's put together, and he is. I mean, if you think about this, John, how many fitness experts are there out there? Mm. Um, there's a lot of them. You go to yeah. any any health club in any city, and you've got 
personal trainers that have a lot of knowledge on this topic of working out and exercise and how to get results. There's definitely no shortage of them. But somebody like Tony Horton who can get in front of a group of people and create that kind of energy and to inspire that type of um, you know, action is, is amazing. And then you combine that with the platform that he's been given through uh, the Beachbody company to you know, have these infomercials and, and to create these videos um, and, and kind of get it into everybody's hands or as many people's hands as possible yeah, yeah. Um, is amazing. But it, it's all from, I think, Tony's ability to really be able to get up in front of a group and not just share his expertise because that's only half of the equation. You know, we've kind of touched upon that already. Um, I could be very knowledgeable in a particular topic, but unless I can inspire and unless I can you know, kind of incite some type of reaction or some type of, you know, revolution, so to speak, you know, people just aren't going to do what you want them to do ultimately or, you know, what you would, um, you know, aspire for them to do. So it's, it's really interesting. It's a great case study talking about Tony Horton. And in fact, you know, he's somebody that I've got on the list of uh, potential guests to reach out oh, to really? to kind of talk about his experience. Yeah. Yeah, that would be awesome. I'm sure it'll be. It might be hard getting him, but mm -hmm. yeah, if you need any help with that too, let me know. Cause I, it's funny. Someone that lives in like the town over from me, she's like good friends with him and awesome. like, talk to him casually on the phone. So I might be able to hook you up there. That would be great. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that would. I think he would be an an awesome guest. Some of those guys in the Beachbody community are pretty amped up. I'm actually probably gonna go and do an insanity workout when I when I'm, off, when I'm done with this recording. <laughs> but, <laughs> I'm I'm starting back up today. Today it's Monday. It's yes. a good day, you know, good day to start. I'm on vacation. That's right. So, but yeah, I mean, did you want to keep going? I know um I know you said you had a you know, I wasn't sure where you were at for time. Sure, sure. I've got a little bit of time, so if there's any other um, you know, lingering questions that you've got in your mind related to what to speak or or public speaking in general, I'd love to to see if we can go a little bit longer. Um, well, I was kind of curious, and maybe the audience might be too, and it's not directly to public speaking, but you've mentioned a few times that um, just referring to your show, you say we. So I don't know, are you, is it just you working on this, or do you have other people on your team like helping you with the show and the podcast? And Yeah, I've got a, a couple of others. Um, you know, one is kind of our, our graphics person um, to kind of help with, with the visual tone of you know, the website, the show, and some of the other things that, that we're working on uh, producing that we'll be releasing in the future. Um, and then I do also have a virtual assistant. Okay. So um, the virtual assistant has been instrumental in a lot of the production for the show. I basically show up and uh, record the, the interview or discussion with each guest and then take those recorded files and pass them off to the virtual assistant to do all of the editing, uh, to put in the graphics, the music, um, every little piece of that they do the, the end production on, create the final files that get uploaded, uh, the show notes, all of that stuff um, is, is things that I don't have to, to really think about. Yeah, the nitty-gritty kind of th stuff. Exactly. I, I think I spent all of last Monday just doing like... I was on vacation last a couple weeks ago, and I, I, I spent like an entire day just writing up the content from all my episodes, uploading them, and doing the tagging and the labeling, and it, yeah, it's it's a pretty it's it's a lot of stuff, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, it's something that I um, you know, I've been fortunate enough to to have um, at least one or two people involved in this besides myself because it it does take. It's not difficult work, but it, it can be tedious. There's a lot of little steps. There's a lot of little things um, that you have to pull together and to be organized about it. Um, you know, like you said, we've got 19 shows live on the site. That's only about half of what we've recorded thus far. I think we're up to uh, right around 50. Oh, and, wow. you know, we're doing a number of them. Every week that goes by, we we're adding at least two or three more to that. Um, I could probably stop right now until February, and I'd be fine. I don't, you know, I've got more than enough shows in the queue, um, but we want to stay ahead of it. And so that informs, like, what we're doing with the social media strategy and planning out the calendar each month um, for what we want to share through social media uh, profiles. Um, we've also got kind of um, 
you know, the plan of where we're going with who do we want to have on the show next. You know, we're, we're able to get a long list of possibilities and then spend the energy and focus on trying to reach out to those guests, some of which we reach out to and they say, I'd love to, but I can't right now. Let's check back in six months. Um, so we're constantly you know, scrubbing that list, making sure that we can keep filling the pipeline um, and not get to a point where we're like, hey, who, who are we going to interview next? We've got to try and scramble to find somebody. Right. Yeah, you got to keep going. I mean, I, I found that to be a little bit of a challenge in some ways, too. I know, um, you know, I've, I've recently been writing for a magazine, and, and I do one interview a month, or I've been, that was sort of my goal, was to do one a month and then focus on a really, like, actionable, specific niche topic where I could create, you know, some really great piece of content out of that. So there's a lot more preparation that I that I put into those interviews and then finding those guests. I mean, the last one, it took me about four months of waiting to get him. No. Yeah. So there is, you know, it's a lot of work. You know, to, it, it's to hard. Um, and I know that's like I said, we've got probably right now our list of potential guests is right around 40. Um, and every week I'll, I'll usually add about, you know, five to ten more names to that, and about every week we're we're securing about five to ten guests. Um, so it's it's something that, and I think w with our topic, you know, our particular niche that we're focused in um, with speaking, there's a lot of people that speak. Yeah, so it's, sure. it's not too difficult to find you know those individuals, but to kind of coordinate their schedule and and also you know I like to mix in not just the the big bigger names. You know, like the Michael Hyatt or the Chris Brogans, um, but also you know people who are kind of very experienced, very knowledgeable um, in in communications or public speaking or you know psychology. We had a psychologist on the show um, talking about like the neuroscience behind how your audience perceives the information mm -hmm. um, that you're delivering. So, I mean, there's lots of interesting people out there beyond the big names, but of course, you know, it's great to also have those big names mixed into what, what you're doing with the show. Um, but those big names, they're hard to get. I, I got a quick funny story for you about Pat Flynn. Sure. It was about three weeks ago, I think, and I was sat down with the virtual assistant on a, a meeting to go through, you know, where we're at with upcoming guests, and I said, "Oh, well, let's let's make sure to add Pat Flynn um, to list. I know he's just started doing some keynote speaking. Um, I had talked, I actually did an interview with Amy Porterfield, and she recommended, um, you know, I connect with Pat. So I was like, "All right, well, let let's try and see if we can get Pat. And if we get him for February, March, April, like that's that should be fine." So the next day, send it an email um, out to him with a batch of other potential guests. And like 15, 20 minutes after that email went out, got an email back from Pat. And he said, how about today? In like two hours. <laughs> wow. And it was like, um, sure, I'll, I'll do whatever we need to do to get this time slot uh, open on the calendar. Mm -hmm. So when I got on with him to do the, um, the recording, I said, you know, Pat, thanks so much. You know, this was, wow, you know, I was not expecting to have this opportunity to talk with you until much later. <laughs> and he said, honestly, he's like, you got lucky because I, I had this whole day blocked off for interviews and there was one person that canceled, so I had this opening and I got your email at the right time and, and said, sure, let's do it. So it worked out really good. And, and of course, he's, he's very gracious and, and a humble yeah. guy and... Um, somebody that I had a blast talking with. Yeah, he was, I think, my, I think it was my 11th interview, and I was sort of the same way, and I think with him, he, he's just sort of giving back, and I've talked with other people about this, and because he wants to give back to all those other people, and, you know, mm -hmm. I've seen him, I think I even saw a guy interviewing him, and the guy, like, didn't, his whole website, like, wasn't even in English, you know, and, like, you know, and Pat's still on there, and I, I've seen other ones where you can tell, like, these guys, like, some of their sites, like, they're really... You know, they're they're kind of just seeing him as like, oh my god, and they're everybody wants to get him, and some yeah. of them really like they they just start these shows and then they just disappear or they never really do much with it. And he's still, you know, his, his whole thing is he's going to be everywhere, and that's like one of his mm -hmm. big things. So I mean, yeah, he's he's really good about that. So something to be learned. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean that, and that was kind of my thing too. I figured, um, 
you know, reaching out to and connecting with people is, has been a really big thing for me. So that's why I've been reaching out to people like you who are kind of like, you know, I, I, I you know, in, in my, it's funny for me because here I am almost, I've now recorded, I think, 50 episodes. I have about, I think it's 46 or 47 published on the blog, but um, I'd still reach out to people who only have 10 episodes that are starting mm -hmm. podcasts that have interesting niches because who knows in a year you could be, you know, the next Pat Flynn or something, you know, it, it, and having the, having that early start or your early communication, you know, I think we were talking earlier, I, um, Navid Moasis, who's going to be launching a Lifestyle Architects podcast, yep. he talks to me all the time on Facebook and we communicate all the time now ever since I interviewed him. So it's, That's awesome. You know. Yeah, I mean, it, it is really about, you know, bu building those relationships and, um, you know, things in this particular space change very quickly and, um, you know, obviously it's, there's the business side of it, but there is the, the personal side and, um, you know, being able to be a real person and not try and, and be a little bit too schmoozy or, um, you know, hypey is, is really a good thing. And especially when it comes to online marketing, you know, a lot of times we all encounter those individuals, but, um, you know, to find those folks who are true, genuine, really good people um, that want to give of their time and, and be helpful as best as they can. You know, it's, it's good to hold on to those relationships and to continue to foster and develop them. Yeah, for sure. So, well, um, John, I, we can wrap up in just a bit, but I, I thought you had a question um, when we were talking earlier before we started about recording like the video podcasts yeah yeah if you I didn't know if you wanted to dive into it I mean it's a whole other discussion in itself but um, I know you know we talked before we started that um, you know you're gonna be launching your podcast as well as audio but also video on iTunes which when you search around Google at least at this current time in December as of the time we're recording this there really is not a lot out there about this topic yeah I you know I've run into that myself with trying to figure out you know, what's the best way to distribute this through iTunes? There is not really any documentation. Um, the stuff that you find is pretty fragmented and um, certainly an opportunity to try and, and, and create some helpful materials around that. Now, for us, we've kind of gone through this experience as best we can, trying to keep it as simple as possible. And, and figure out the best way to submit it to iTunes. So we've done that. We're, we're actually at this time right now waiting to hear back um, whether or not the show will be approved. We've got an audio version and the video version. The audio version is not going to be an issue, um, but I'm really interested in seeing what happens with the video. Um, essentially, we took the, the format, the size, and everything, essentially what you see on whatthespeak.com that's embedded into the site, um, and, and translated that over into something that would be submitted through our RSS feed um, through Libsyn, our, our media direct or, um, media host. Yep. And you know, I'm curious to find out: is there anything extra that we need to do to make these files um, accessible for multiple types of devices? Because you know, if you pull it up on your your desktop computer, if you have the iTunes window open all the way. You know, it's probably going to stretch the video all the way out to fill out the screen. Right, right. You know, and if you recorded it like a, a 500 by 400 type resolution, let's say, you know, pixels wide, it's going to really stretch it out. And then you've got smaller devices, you know, iPhones and Android devices, et cetera. So we're waiting to see. The jury's still out on that. And I think as a result of the process that we're going through right now, um, we'll be able to refine that and say, here, this is the best way that we found to be able to do it. Um, and share that with everybody. Now, I do get a lot of questions about production on the front end of, of creating these videos. Um, you know, they're very simple, but we try to just put a, a nice little touch or polish on them um, so that it's not just the standard, you know, we've all seen them, the side-by-side -side Skype interviews. Right, you um, have your logo and you've got like this kind of black and white I noticed kind of theme. Going. Yeah, we, we wanted it to be something that stood out. So when, when people watched it, um, obviously, again, you know, the content's great. Um, at least I think so. <laughs> yeah. But the, uh, the content's great, but the delivery of it is also, you know, just the, the little nuances to how you package it up um, is the stuff that stands out in, in front of people's minds. And, um, you know, it's, I think earlier this year I saw a music video. Um, 
on YouTube that I was watching, and it was black and white, and I was like, oh, that looks so, like, classic. Hmm. Um, and the thing that I hate a lot of times with, with the Skype videos is that the images, the video images sometimes, especially depending on, you know, your guests' um, side of things, you know, they're not the, the highest quality. Right. You know, not everybody has an HD camera, et cetera. And so I thought, oh, if we could just, if we convert the video from color to black and white, um, and have that kind of high contrast um, style to it. It looks classic. It looks fresh and clean and not something that's, you know, the typical that you see. Um, and so we were able to do that pretty easily, and we do everything in ScreenFlow. So, um, you know, with, with ScreenFlow, it's very easy. If you haven't heard of it yet, um, you know, I'm sure you'll, it's something that will come up soon. Um, on your radar, but ScreenFlow is for the Mac only, unfortunately, but it's something that you can just drag and drop files right in there and just start editing, slicing, right. adding effects. Um, it's very, very, very simple to use, so um, that's what we do. The other thing is GarageBand is what we're actually using for the audio, so um, everything does go to... Actually, when I record the interviews, I've got two MacBooks set up side by side. Um, wow. So typically, you know, we do them through Skype, and we use Ecamm's call recorder software to capture the um, the audio and video of my guest. And then I've got an HD camera and a uh, kind of a high-end broadcast microphone uh, that captures my audio and my video and gets sent to another MacBook. Um, and the reason why is that running um, these different softwares at the same time on one computer. Um, can be problematic. Sometimes they don't want to work together, um, recording different things at the same time, and so I just keep them separate. Hmm. You don't have to do that, but it's, it's the thing that I've found that works very, very well without any issue. Um, so the, the audio goes into GarageBand on my side, and then the video gets captured by ScreenFlow on the other computer. And then once we're done, all the files get put together, um, brought into ScreenFlow, and the audio actually gets some some uh, pre-production stuff done on the audio to clean it up and make sure it's nice, um, you know, high levels, etc. And then that gets brought into ScreenFlow, and that's the final place where everything um, gets pieced together and then um, exported out for what gets put live on whatthespeak.com, and then yeah. uh, right here in the near future, what gets posted on iTunes. Now, are you using? Um, I just wanted to, you know, make a note. If any, if you happen to be using it, maybe you don't. You're not aware of it. Um, are you using Euphonic for your audio uh, algorithms and uploading? No, no, not at all. Is that is that something that's similar to Levelator? Um, I I've I've heard of Levelator, but um, I guess as a sort of heads up, and we can talk after the recording. But sure. Um, for anyone listening, and I've mentioned this on past episodes, it's kind of a, a godsend for me. It saved me. I can't even imagine how much time. Um, it's basically a glorified all-in-one like podcast uploading system, mm -hmm. and it will automatically improve all the audio levels, take out background noise. It will, you know, cut out anything that really would be junk, and it will also improve based upon if it's like music you'd hear or like actual audio and talking. Um, nice. And then the best part is you can link it to any like external third-party host like Libsyn or archive.org. Um, I actually, I wasn't really, my show wasn't monetized enough at the time to even go with Libsyn, so I'm not even paying for hosting anymore. I actually switched to free hosting through archive.org. Nice. And the system just uploads everything. I, I can, I basically run my business for web hosting and my list building application, so I'm paying maybe like twenty dollars a month to run my business. Very good. Yeah. No, I would I would be interested in checking that out. It sounds yeah. somewhat similar. You know, Levelator is really just it just adjusts the audio levels um, so that everything is kind of clear and even across the whole uh, MP3 file. But um, you know, as far as the, the the sound filtering and and kind of blocking out background noise and stuff, that's you know. We're using GarageBand for that right now. Yeah, but I'll I've send you a link and you can look at it. I know I was going to mention Pat Flynn is using it now ever since I told him about it. I tweeted him the link and he was like, I'm intrigued. And he just mentioned it in his like top, I think it was like top 20, 20 something useful applications that he uses. And he mentioned it in there. And nice. I commented and he was like, oh, you were the one who told me about this. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> Hilarious. So, so but cool. But yeah, um, 
I figure we'll wrap things up. Uh, you know, thanks for coming on the show and taking time out of your afternoon. Yeah, thanks so much. It was great talking with you. Um, you know, if anybody has questions about public speaking or uh, presentation design, anything related to that topic, you know, feel free to send me an email, Brian B R Y A N at whatthespeak.com, and uh, we'll make sure that we get you an answer. Cool. Thanks for uh, taking your time, Brian. You bet. We'll talk to you later. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye.